Welcome, everybody. We're just waiting for everyone to enter the Zoom. We'll start in just a moment. Again, uh, welcome everyone to our Hard Histories webinar. I'm Martha Jones. Launched in fall 2020, the Hard Histories at Hopkins Project examines the role that racism and discrimination have played at Johns Hopkins, blending research, teaching, public engagement, and the creative arts. Hard Histories aims to engage our broadest communities at Johns Hopkins and in Baltimore in a frank and informed exploration of the myths that have become part of our university story and to offer evidence of how race and racism shaped Johns Hopkins story. In the spring 2023, uh, we've been hosting a series of conversations exploring the histories of blackness, slavery and racism in the Maryland area and beyond. And in the Heart Histories Lab, it has been a semester for breaking silences. Our work began with a look at the March 1873 letter that Johns Hopkins penned to the men he selected to steer the future of the hospital that eventually bore his name. Among his provisions were those that related to what became the Johns Hopkins Hospital Colored Orphan Asylum. Today at Johns Hopkins, We've had very little to say about what his words came to mean. Our research aims to remedy that by examining the records from the asylum and understanding how it ultimately provided for, quote, the reception, maintenance, and education of orphan colored children, as Mr. Hopkins put it. These words, reception, maintenance, and education, had no plain meaning in the lives of girls resident in the asylum during its operation between 1875 and 1914. To discover the lived experience of these terms, we reviewed the surviving asylum records, most of them concerning administrative and financial matters, along with news reports, city directories, census returns and maps to recover the perspective of the hundreds of girls and for a time, the few boys who resided there. Some of us are coming to, to you today from the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus in the Wyman Park building on the very site where once stood the colored orphan asylum. Just as the hospital was preparing to close the asylum in 1914, Gilman Hall was going up on property just across the way. Two visions for young people's futures in Baltimore and beyond faced off here and stood in stark contrast. One encouraged black girls educated in middle-class ways to spend their lives in service to others. The second promoted the education of young white men for elite leadership and to become the heads of households that would run on the labor of girls like those resident in the orphan asylum. For a moment at Johns Hopkins, both things were true. To host our webinar today, I'm thrilled to introduce one of our um, esteemed collaborators this semester, Dr. Amy Rosencrantz. She received her PhD from Notre Dame of Maryland University, where she wrote the dissertation, one that we have studied carefully, The Good Work, 
St. Francis Orphan Asylum and St. Elizabeth Home, two Baltimore orphanages for African Americans. In 2018, Dr. Rosencrantz was awarded the Joseph L. Arnold Prize for Outstanding Writing on Baltimore History by the Baltimore City Historical Society for her paper, The Good Work, The Franciscan Sisters of St. Mary, Mill Hill, and the African American Mission in Baltimore. Dr. Rosencrantz is currently a middle school social studies teacher in Baltimore City Schools. In her spare time, she is the secretary of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center Executive Board, where she was one of the volunteer researchers for the Women's Suffrage Centennial Project. That's where we first met Dr. Rosencrantz. Her current project, Memories of the Baltimore Women's Industrial Exchange, strives to document the history of the institution and the people who made it a Baltimore icon. And I'm gonna pass the mic over to Dr. Rosencrantz. Thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I am honored and delighted to be here today. Uh, today, I am excited to host a discussion featuring research presentations from Hard History's project director, Dr. Martha S. Jones, Spring 2023 Research Lab webinar. The class has primarily studied the records of the Colored Orphan Asylum. Created pursuant to Mr. Hopkins' 1873 will, the asylum operated from 1875 to 1914 and provided lodging and other support to children whose family circumstances kept them from remaining at home. Lab members have investigated the migration of the asylum site from Biddle Street to Remington and 31st Streets on what is today the JHU Homewood campus. They have also recovered the names and in some cases the life stories of the approximately 300 girls resident in the asylum and have explored what care meant in a place that prepared girls for lives of domestic service in the homes of others. I have truly been honored to work with this incredible group of people. Um, it's, always, it's always fascinating to be able to go into an archive and have someone to discuss topics with. And this research project is really adding to the history of orphanages in Baltimore. I will take this opportunity now to introduce all four of our panelists. Each student will present their research in turn for approximately 10 minutes, then, Dr. Jones will come on at the end to lead a brief Q&A with the audience. I invite our panelists now to turn their microphones and cameras on. Emma Catherine Bilski is a PhD candidate in history at Johns Hopkins University, who currently works as a teaching and research assistant in the hard histories at Hopkins Research Lab. She also holds a master's in global and imperial history from the University of Oxford, the UK. Her research deals broadly with histories of religion, race, and violence in the early modern world. And she's been working in public histories in many different forms mm -hmm. since 2011. Today, her undergraduate teaching and public facing consulting work involves paleography, the art of deciphering old handwriting. That's quite a skill and ethno-historical methods and focuses thematically on indigenous Native American and black histories of the greater Baltimore era. Thanks, Emma Catherine. Kamal Carr is an undergraduate student studying molecular and cellular biology in public health studies at Johns Hopkins University. She is currently a student in Dr. Martha Jones' Hard Histories at Hopkins Spring 2023 Research Lab. As a Baltimore local, she's taken an interest in discovering the important connections between the historic city and Johns Hopkins community. Matt Palmer, he, they, is a senior history student minoring in Latin American studies. They are excited about how financial records can be used to illustrate the daily lives of girls at the Colored Orphan Asylum. Emma Petit is a junior majoring in political science and international studies with a focus on racial politics. An aspiring civil rights attorney, she is fascinated by the process of uncovering the untold stories of Johns Hopkins under Dr. Jones' stewardship. Outside of class, she is on the executive committee of the Hopkins Foreign Affairs Symposium, is an intern for the Black Girls Vote Research Network and tutors at a local prison. This summer, she will be taking the archival tools she has learned from the Hard Histories course 
and applying them to original research on Hopkins' newly acquired archives of the Black Panther Party newspaper. Before I turn the conversation over to our first presenter, I want to mention that live captioning is available to our audience members within Zoom. We are also posting a link in the chat to the live transcript URL for those who prefer to access captions that way. We will be taking your questions later in the program, but please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A feature at any time. Now, I am delighted to turn this conversation over to Hopkins PhD candidate, Emma Catherine Bilson. Thank you for all being, thank you for all of you for being here today. And I will see you at the end of the discussion. Wow, okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Rosencrantz. Oh my gosh, it has been so fantastic to work with you this semester. Um, and, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, so as you heard in my bio, I've, I've been doing this kind of public facing history work for a while. Um, and increasingly, you know, Baltimore centrically for the, the last few years. So it was a, it's, you know, it, it's been a real honor to, to have been able to work finally with, with hard histories at Hopkins um, this semester, um, at least in an official capacity. Um, and, um, and so as the sort of teaching slash research assistant for this semester, I, I got the chance to do a research project too, um, which was fantastic uh, and, and really great experience. Um, and I focused on the first site of the orphanage what, on what used to be Biddle Street West, um, and is now it's like along um, MLK Junior Boulevard. Uh, and if any of you Baltimore or Baltimore history folks know of Orchard Street Church, um, it was right. It was right there. Um, you know, that's Orchard Street Church is a really big, like famous historical black church in the city. Um, and 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 so <laughs> I uh, I have experience giving historical walking tours professionally. Um, although, you know, years ago, for the most part. Um, and, and Professor Jones had floated the idea of a walking tour um, of at, at some point in the semester, uh, which was also before we figured out that the second site of, you know, of the um, orphanage was underneath our classroom. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, a walking tour at some point in the semester. And, and I thought it might help us to be able to see something um, of the literal and figurative horizons of, of the girls in the orphanage at that site. Um, the orphanage that we we sort of colloquially referred to as the GHCOA um, or just the orphanage. And, um, and, and there's, no, there's no trace of, of that GHCOA site left. Um, and there's very little documentary record um, of of the lives of the girls at this site, like even less than for the um, the Remington site, and you know, but but I found it helpful, um, you know, and interesting um, to to have to keep track of and think critically about these you know little pieces of information about the site um, and the buildings of the site um, that. Um, you know, I was finding in places like, um, I told you the meeting minutes of the Hopkins Hospital Board of Trustees. And, you know, okay, so for instance, in 1884, the hospital trustees approved the motion to build an addition onto the laundry at the orphanage. Okay, so why did they need extra laundry space? Well, one, 57 children and teenagers will produce a lot of laundry on a regular basis. But in 1883, um, the lady managers um, of the orphanage, which you'll hear more about soon, um, the lady managers of the orphanage had told the hospital board that they were training some of the girls to be laundresses. So, um, you know, little little details like that. Um, and and so I wrote a walking tour um, out of out of the research I had done this semester um, in the the hop the um, the Chesney Medical Archives um, with uh, with the help of archivist Heather Cooper, who I guess we haven't mentioned yet, but is amazing. Thank you, Heather. Um, many thanks. Um, anyway, um, you know, uh, so working in the you know the Chesney Archives, um, the you know the Hopkins Medical Archives, and the papers of the orphanage, which I believe have just been have linked, been linked in the chat. 
Um, and also like Sanborn fire insurance maps and just, you know, city directories, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, compiling all of that into to a walking tour um, and essentially situating the orphanage at the Biddle Street site in context with, for instance, um, the churches the girls went to, um, the, uh, the old Hawkins, uh, or actually wait, so one, the churches the girls went to, um, to the, the many, many black and white um, religious and charitable institutions um, in that neighborhood. And um, three, also the old Hawkins University campus in Mount Vernon, um, which was really quite close to the orphanage at that site and founded around the same time, 1875, 1876. Um, but there was no real or at least no evident relationship between the university and the orphanage. Um, although Daniel Quake Gilman, the, you know, the first president of Johns Hopkins University was on the board of trustees for a different orphanage um, on the other side of town, um, um, an orphanage for, for white girls. Um, so, so clearly, you know, if you've been reading our Substack, you've heard about sort of the, the, the juxtapositions, um, and you'll hear more about that in a minute, but, but clearly these sort of fundamental but uncomfortable um, juxtapositions have been part of the story of Mr. Johns Hopkins's bequest since the very beginning. Um, and, you know, and, and the format of an hour and a half long walking tour is a great format for showing that. Um, and even though, I'm going to share my screen if I, oops, whoa, if I can, um, really quick. Yeah, sure. Whoop, no, can you guys see that? The, I mean, okay. Yes, we can see it. Yes, okay, sorry. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, Okay, yeah, so so neither um, the, the old university campus, this is a photo from Hopkins retrospective at, at the Hopkins Library, um, also who are fantastic. Um, and um, and this is the, the old orphanage site. So ne oops, neither of these, these places are, are um, still extant, like neither building is still there um, or none of these buildings are still there, but there are enough um, places uh, or buildings from, from the era um, that are still there that we were sort of able to, to you know, kind of anchor ourselves in, in present day time and space and also past time and space. So this is, um, that's, that's Orchard Street Church, um, which the girls uh, went to um, at that site. So yeah, so we did the walking tour together as a lab. Um, that's that photo. Um, and that's, that's the, the corner of the block where the orphanage used to be. Um, and anyway, we did, we did it together as a lab, which was an excellent way to get ourselves out of the Hopkins bubble um, and to introduce some of the undergrads to the old city, the 19th century city, um, and to, to get something of a tangible sense of the JHCOA girls world um, back in the 1870s through 1890s. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what the afterlife of this walking tour will be. Um, certainly becoming part of the institutional memory of, of Johns Hopkins through Heart Histories and Hopkins Retrospective. Um, but beyond that, I guess I'm welcome to suggestions. Um, and, and I want to finish by saying that we've, gosh, um, we've been super impressed, super, super impressed um, with the conscientiousness and care um, that these undergrads have brought to this work um, and, and, and their courage in facing some pretty distressing materials and sitting with a lot of uncomfortable information um, together as a lab, yet together in the archive, as you heard, um, you know, but also alone separately um, and, and wrangling with tough questions about research ethics, um, like serious, serious questions um, and, you know, serious, serious mater materials, serious consideration. And, and so massive, sincere kudos to, to them, to the undergraduate students for their hard work this semester, but also for their care and conscientiousness. So I hope you will join me in being super excited to hear more about their work. So Kamal, take it away. Thank you, Emma Catherine. Um, just before I begin, I want to 
mention how grateful I am to have the chance to work with some amazing individuals and meet so many new people and gain so many new experiences and just overall be a part of some very important work. Now I will share my screen. Perfect. And if I could get a verbal cue on if everyone can see that. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so just to reintroduce myself, my name is Kamal and I have been with the Hard Histories Research Lab here um, at the Homewood campus this semester. And I will be presenting my research on the Johns Hopkins Colored Orphan Asylum. And just to give a very brief overview, the Johns Hopkins Colored Orphan Asylum was operated from 1875 to 1917 and was established by Mr. Johns Hopkins to serve as a home for Black orphan children in Baltimore. Um, they were provided with food, housing, medical care, education, religious guidance, and training in domestic service, which eventually enabled them to pursue what they called respectable employment, um, which I will get into a bit later. Um, my aspect of the project, as you can tell, focuses on the orphans themselves, mainly in covering their identity, their names, who they were, and some stories that tell us their identity outside of what the US Census classifies them as, which is just orphans and inmates because they are so much more. Now, majority of my time was spent at the Alan Mason Chesney Medical Archives, where I conducted an extensive archival research this involved analyzing documents such as financial reports and expense receipts, which I can show you here now. These are just a few examples. Um, I specifically worked with the post-closure expense documents ranging from the years 1917 to 1921. And um, these were just itemized receipts of purchases made from household stores, shoe shops, um, anything for the girls. And this was the primary way that I was able to uncover so many names and so many identities. Um, as you can tell, I work with both handwritten um, pieces of document, which were a bit difficult to transcribe, but thank you, Emma, Catherine, for helping me with that process. Um, but as long with along with some typed out ex expense sheets, which were a little bit easier to write. Um, so along with this, I also um, included the U.S. Census. This is just a picture of the U.S. Uh, census from 1880. Um, it played a large role in discovering like a larger volume of names um, because it also acted as like a city directory and told us who resided in these asylums, including the matrons um, and others. Now, I also utilized newspapers like the Baltimore Sun and additional ancestry library uh, resources to conduct further biological research on individual children and to learn more about who they are and their stories. Now, with all of this in place, with all of this research being done, um, I was able to uncover over 200 unique names out of the 712 names that I found um, while doing my research. Now, the reason it goes from 712 to 200 was mainly because there's lots of duplicates and I wanted to ensure that I wrote down and documented every single account that I could find um, just so I can develop a timeline or offer these resources to other researchers who might be interested. But uh, mainly, that reduction was because of removing the duplicate names and some inconsistencies that we see throughout different transcribed documents. Now, before I showcase where I um, displayed all this information, I want to kind of explain one of the biggest challenges I faced when doing my research or obviously coming into how to present my research. Um, it was in regards to the names and kind of the larger ethical questions behind, should I be the ones, should I be the one to 
give this information? Should I be the one sharing this information as opposed to family members? Um, now, these records are already publicly accessible from the Chesney archives, but my main goal was to have this information available to anyone with the aim of promoting transparency, accuracy, and respect for the individual, and also encouraging family members to discover and gain a deeper understanding of their ancestral history. I was at a crossroads. While part of me wanted to achieve this goal, I acknowledged that publishing these names in such a way could come off as exploitative and disrespectful, which is never my intention. But um, I had a discussion with Dr. Cooper, Dr. Nerdine, and Dr. Jones about this topic at the Exploring Medical archives webinar which some of you may have attended in addition to speaking with Dr. Rosenkranz where I learned that every historian has their own way of going about presenting such sensitive information whether it be with full names pseudonyms or other variations now I was told that the decision was up to me and I decided that I would be stating their full names because I do deserve that I do believe that these girls should not be forgotten and the best way would be to display their full names with careful consideration, respect, and acknowledgement of both them and their descendants. Now, I will show you the website where I have compiled all this information and um, encapsulated everything. So uh, this is just a simple Google Sites to, um, website. As you can see, I have like our main mission with um, the overall history, the very brief history of the orphan asylum and my goals. And now I do have this names tab where I went ahead and listed over 200 names with the most accurate spelling that I was able to find. Now, looking at it from outside perspective this is a lot of information to just throw at you all at once um, I did also provide a disclaimer that one of the main aspects of sharing this information with respect is to acknowledge that the girls may not have used these names they could have had nicknames that we just this is information we just might not be able to know and depending on like different cultural or linguistic contexts there might be different variations in spelling. And if others were to encounter different variations, they shouldn't consider those as intentionally wrong because everything is up, open up to interpretation. Now this will be accessible uh, when the official poster is uploaded to the Hard Histories at Hopkins uh, website. So you can have access to it there. And before I conclude this presentation, I wanted to share a very special and in the works story of Minetta Walker, who was one of the orphans residing in the asylum. Um, now, my experience with researching with Minetta and her story started in the 1910 US Census, where she was only 10 years old. And like all of the orphans, she was classified as an inmate, and there was no other information besides her age. Now, it wasn't until I was going through these post-closure refund receipts of 1919 uh, to 1921, where I discovered some information that compelled me to learn more about who she was. Um, I will show you what I saw exactly. It were, these were, receipts for expenses. And as you can see, it includes mentions of a baby outfit, a baby carriage, more clothing and shoes for herself and a baby, and more clothes for her and baby Alice. Minetta had a child while she was at the orphanage. And we found out that her name was Alice. This is information that you can't just get from a US census. And it's huge. It's a large piece of their identity. And I want to um, share this with you because I found that it was very memorable. Um, but yes, let me see if I can get all of this.
now, okay, now this is where I started digging into some annual reports of the Colored Orphan Asylum. And I discovered that in 1920, two of the girls, it was reported that two of the girls had illegitimate children. Now it is not confirmed whether Mineta was one of these uh, girls who had children in 1920, but based off of the documents um, that I just showed, there is a large assumption that that is very true. And in 1921, there was report of a girl, a mother, 20 years of age, the same as Mineta would have been in 1921, um, who was considered deficient mentally and had kept her baby for a year, year while working before the fam before the baby was boarded in a properly supervised home. This is a suggestion that Mineta was possibly separated from Alice as she was working and maybe due to what um, the orphan asylum considered her mental condition. Um, I did some more research within the ancestry resources and I found that within the 1920 census, Mineta was a servant in a white household of Harold Ballard. Uh, quick mention, this is what the Colored Orphan Asylum had initially trained them to do. This was a reference to respectable employment, working for white families once they left the asylum. It puts a lot of things into perspective as we've uncovered accounts of many orphans working as servants. But continuing on in the 1930 census, I find that Mineta is no longer in Maryland, but in Manhattan, New York. So within the span of, I believe, 10 years, she has left Maryland and now moved to New York, where she was residing in the home of a Black woman named Sarah Matley but she wasn't alone. In fact, she was accompanied by Blondine Walker, who was also an orphanage at the Colored Orphan Asylum, the same time that Mineta was. I did later discovered that this was, in fact, her sister. After the closure of the asylum, she was reunited almost 10 years later with her sister, but there was no mention still of baby Alice. Now, both Mineta and Blondine worked as servants for private families. It's unknown whether it was the same family, um, but the last thing I found was that in 1940 census, Blondine was lodging under a black man named Thomas Jennings, but Mineta was not mentioned here. Now, these are only bits and parts of a larger story that still needs to be uncovered, and I'm still actively working on trying to get more details of, but there's so many questions left up unanswered as in what happens to baby Alice? Didn't Mineta ever visit her? Why did she separate from her sister within that 10 year time frame? But the main takeaway of this is that these girls did not go through the same experiences and we cannot categorize them as this monolith. Now, if only time had allowed, I wish that I were able to learn more about each and every one of the, these girls because their stories are so dear to me and so compelling. Now. To conclude, while working on this project, um, the main thing I discovered was that these names would serve as foundational knowledge for any interested historians, researchers, and family members. The stories I shared today is exactly what I hope occurs beyond this project. Uh, I hope it encourages others to utilize the information that our entire project has provided um, and to gain that curiosity to learn more about these girls were once forgotten. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. I will now pass the program on to Matt. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. Okay, um, verbal confirmation. Can everyone see this right now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yes, so hi, everyone. Um, as I've said before, I'm Matt Palmer, and I'm a member of the um, uh, Hard Histories Project here at Johns Hopkins. And, you know, I'm really, I mean, apart from being just like very honored to work with um, the amazing staff here and my classmates, I was really struck by the great like overlap between all of our researches. Um, as Kamal just said, uh, her work was really focused on kind of like ideas of future and the outcomes of the girls at the asylum. And I think this is very interesting because my project also really um, centers around the central theme uh, throughout my research. So 
what was my research? Well, to begin with, um, I kind of, like Dr. Jones said earlier, kind of went back to that original founding document by Johns Hopkins um, about basically what the asylum was going to be. And I was just really interested in kind of interrogating questions of care and education, right? What did this specifically mean in the time period? We see a lot of references to words like education and reception, but they're somewhat vague in the period if you just read it in a newspaper. Um, so I think through doing some archival research, I can really better contextualize that and give a more fleshed out picture of both the lives of the girls themselves and their interactions with the larger Baltimore community. So like everyone else, my research at, was at the Chesney uh, Libraries or Chesney Medical Archives so far, I should say. And my research really revealed, uh, as Dr. Jones said in a earlier post, a really cruel juxtaposition in the kind of outcomes for these girls. So. I focused on bills of receipts um, that can be accessed at the Chesney. And I think these bills tell like a very interesting story, um, a somewhat horrifying story, but interesting nonetheless, because so in regards of like maintenance and care, the girls did get somewhat decent care. They were given quality nutrition and were given certain luxuries uh, such as eyeglasses and uh, dental visits. You can see right here in these sources, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, um, here are receipts from the um, Von Schreicher Dental Institute right here. And what was really exciting about all these sources is that, I don't know if you can see right here, these are all names of girls. And I think it's just very exciting when looking through these archival materials to find direct references to the girls themselves, because in a context like the um, asylum, it's very difficult to find that. It's all very um, professional in a way. So to see these like glimpses of the girls themselves is very interesting. Uh, so just to move on to my object, or sorry, I should actually get into education. So while the girls were physically very well cared for, well, somewhat, um, it's very troubling because as Kamal has said earlier, the all these luxuries that they're receiving, these eyeglasses and these dental cares, the girls were not respected to receive these really upon graduation uh, when they reached the age of 18. Uh, the institution was really premised on the idea that they were training these girls to become laundresses, seamstresses, and servants in white households. And I think the education of these girls actually reflects that because as we'll see later in the presentation, um, when girls were educated after the asylum shut down in 1917, the education that they were receiving in a public segregated high school was of remarkably poor quality, which really kind of um, excluded any chance or at least in principle of them reaching um, financial mobility and empowerment. So my objective right here is just to really see how the asylum cared for these girls and what their futures were expected to be like. And I was just really interested in these receipts um, in giving glimpses into the lives of the daily of the girls, because I think while they are somewhat short, I do think in some cases they can be really uh, telling and revealing. So my methods right here, I analyzed the Chesney Medical Archives bills by vendor collection. And I was very um, cognizant of recording all the names of the girls. Um, I don't know if I'm as impressive as Kamal with 200, but I, I did get a pretty decent amount of names, so I'm very happy with that. Um, and then to kind of like with this strong layer of like primary researches or resources done, I would just look at Baltimore uh, Sun News articles that kind of reference or find explicit references to the, um, the asylum itself. And I found some interesting information about the um, expectations of the girls. Um, now, what was really um, revealing was the use of the censuses. Censuses, of course, as, as Kamala said earlier, are somewhat limited um, uh, in the information that they can tell. It is kind of difficult to trace like the lineages sometimes of these girls. Um, but these were just very interesting because they were very good, like compliments to the actual archival research done that I did the Chesney. And one thing I've been very interested kind of at my times of, at Hopkins is how can, I guess, data visualizations really kind of flesh out the lives of these girls, but also the kind of larger space that they were interacting with. Um, it's a work in progress right now. So when my Substack po post comes up, I'm be happy to share this with you, but I'm really interested in kind of working with ArcGIS technology to really like kind of map out the spaces that these girls were traveling to. Um, because sometimes when you look at these receipts, what's good about a receipt is that they actually give you like a, a full address. And I think that's exciting because you can actually track that address and see where it is in the current Baltimore uh, landscape. And as uh, Emma Catherine has told me, they really haven't changed that much since oh, the 1870s. I mean, there's some differences here and there, but 
they're more or less the same. So when I found these addresses, I kind of consulted uh, Baltimore city directories just to make sure that they all matched up and just to give some additional context. And then I placed them onto a 1915 geo-reference Baltimore map on ArcGIS, and you will see that shortly. Um, I just think movement is such a like really essential part of this project for me because in regards to um, the futures of these girls, it's very interesting because a majority of, so for example, right here, the dental offices and the uh, Charles E. Euchre prescription optician, those are located on Howard Street, which was not so far away from the original Johns Hopkins campus. Um, and I just think that's interesting because as Kamal said, um, you know, these two organizations had very different like ideas of what mobility and upward mobility and upward uh, economic mobility would really mean. Um, people at Hopkins, white people at Hopkins were going there to receive those leadership positions. And then the girls were getting these tastes of this kind of middle class lifestyle as they were going into these, you know, um, offices. But as my research has shown, they weren't really expected to have the same. Um, they weren't really expected to enjoy these like luxuries with their children, which I think is really especially cruel. Um, so my results. So uh, as I looked at the bounded materials at the um, asylum or sorry, at the Chesney, I showed that the or it showed that the girls enjoyed a fresh a diet of fresh meat, fruits, vegetables, occasionally candy. Um, the records also did kind of reinforce their role as servants or seamstresses. You do see pretty frequently throughout the records uh, references to sewing needles, um, prepared garments, things like that. Um, as I've said earlier, there are references to the actual appointments uh, at the dentist and the prescription that these girls went to. Um, also, throughout the the thing, um, throughout the um, the archival research that I did, I also noticed that there was really like a huge focus on making the asylum appear as like visually pleasing as possible. There are references to a playground that was constructed. Um, a lot of newspapers from the Baltimore Sun describe the kind of like scenic environment of the camp or the um, asylum itself. Um, and I think that's just kind of interesting because that really juxtaposes with the frankly terrifying um, program that they had for the girls in the asylum itself. Now, while I did argue earlier that asylum care was somewhat developed, um, there are some caveats to that. Um, it's really important not to take this at face value because the asylum's care that Johns Hopkins himself really outlined in the 1870s didn't really apply to, um, well, death, frankly, as deceased girls were acknowledged, they were physically cared for as they were transferred to Laurel Cemetery, which for you, those of you who don't know is a historically black and um, kind of famous um, black cemetery in the history of Baltimore. Um, it no longer exists, unfortunately, there's a shopping center built on top of it. But what I found striking when I was reading this specific source right here is that there's very detailed references to movement of the girl herself, um, her treatments that she received at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and then her unfortunate um, uh, um, transport to um, uh, Laurel Cemetery. But there's really no mention of her family at all. The families uh, don't really show up in any of these materials. And I think that's like very important because I, I think the term orphanages or asylum when describing this whole process isn't the best term because as we know through like archival records and newspapers, some of these girls did have um, living relatives. I think the 1920 census is a particularly good example of that. There is a uh, Leela Cornish who shows up really, I begin, I believe in 1910. And then in 1920, when the asylum shuts down, she's still living with her mother um, as a, a servant. So I just thought that was uh, notable. But yeah, um, really the asylum was not particularly interested in kind of preserving the familial ties of the girls themselves. Um, because as we look in the 1910 census, I was trying to find the kind of relationship between a girl, Teresa Cornish, and um, I was trying to find her parents. And it was very difficult because I couldn't really find um, references to her exact parents. In the 1910 census, her caretaker is listed as like the asylum itself. So that was kind of one of the more troubling parts of my research as the asylum really was not concerned with kind of integrating these girls with their broader families and kind of kept them in this like uh, somewhat restricted space, which I thought was upsetting. Um, to kind of go on uh, regarding education, beyond care, um, 
as I've said before, the explicit purpose of this space was really to train girls to become laundresses, seamstresses, and servants for white households. And um, I, you know, Kam Kamal has really said this throughout her presentation, but what I thought was particularly frightening is that there is a source from 1917 in the Baltimore Sun, which describes um, the, um, which describes like how these girls were moved uh, to a segregated public high school and the education there was frankly terrible. The person who wrote that article recorded that it was really not of the best quality. So that really kind of exposes the kind of like juxtaposition is that while the asylum was very focused on maintaining a good outward appearance and caring for the girls physically, there was really not that much um, care given to their actual education themselves, which is doubly upsetting because as Dr. Jones said earlier um, in on, you know, the mid or early 20th century, the Gilman campus was really being constructed so close to the asylum itself. So now that I've kind of went over my research and uh, my results, um, I think that really the ultimate point of this research is to show that this really should complicate kind of notions as Johns Hopkins as this um, overwhelmingly positive philanthropic uh, organization throughout Baltimore, as while it did care for girls, there's obviously much more to it than that. Um, as I seen by the kind of lack of education and the really limited career outcomes for these girls. Um, and this is really important because it's not like this was just like a standard for the time or anything like that. There were institutions at the same time, such as Bowie State University, that was actually providing quality education to Black students. But as we can see, Johns Hopkins and the orphanage completely failed in that regard. Um, so really, uh, to kind of take my research further, I really think that my research is really just a small part of what can be done throughout for um, kind of child care organizations throughout Baltimore in the early 20th century. In my research, I found references to other uh, child care centers that the girls both traveled to and were just mentioned in newspapers. So I really hope that a similarly um, focused kind of approach can be applied to these asylums to kind of just tell what life was like and what the um, actual uh, uh, ideas of like advancement and uh, opportunity were for the people within those spaces. Okay, so um, I appreciate you all uh, seeing my presentation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to pass it off to Emma. So please, Emma, take it away. First off, uh, great job to Matt and Kamal. And I'm gonna share my screen for everyone. Um, okay, let's make this full screen. Okay, um, so hi everyone. So first I just wanna say that I feel really fortunate to have had this experience along my lab mates sort of echoing what they were saying but it's also it's really it's all too easy to go through Hopkins and learn nothing about this city and our institutions place within it and so I'm grateful that the lab has effectively like popped the Hopkins bubble and made it so that at least for me and I imagine for Matt as well Kamal's from Baltimore so a little different but that that bubble can never go up again but anyways um my research this semester has focused on the asylum's lady managers who are also known um, in official records as the board of visitors and as that latter name suggests these roughly 25 women would make infrequent visits to the asylum meet with the asylum's matrons who are directly in charge of the girls and prepare reports and recommendations to the johns hopkins hospital board on the colored orphans asylum which was an all-male board and I want to briefly give a quick shout out to Dr. Rosencrans, whose independent research on the Women's Christian Temperance Union proved contemporaneous and incredibly useful for me in contextualizing the role that lady managers held in Greater Baltimore. Um, so my goals and objectives with this research were to sort of understand um, what roles these women played in larger Baltimore society that might impact some of their attitudes uh, towards the girls or the asylum in general, and then also um, who it's interesting because in almost all of the official reports, these women are listed by their husband's names. So I wanted to figure out what sort of power their husbands held in Baltimore and how that might um, influence or just simply play a part in their governorship of the Orphans Asylum. So as it turns out, the women who served on this board represented a host of Baltimore's most elite families. The lady managers had a president, two vice presidents, a secretary, a treasurer, and roughly 20 general body members at any given time. The women of the lady managers frequently graced the Baltimore Sun Society section and many were linked, whether through marriage or blood, to some of Baltimore's most prominent and elite men. Many of these women were active in Baltimore's Quaker Society. Others were involved with other Baltimore asylums, namely one for the aged and infirm, 
while others still were involved with other notable progressive philanthropic efforts at the time, for example, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, so really quickly, I wanna uh, get, oh, that's a little too zoomed in, bring everyone's attention to this picture that um, Dr. Rosencrantz provided me of Ellen Penrose Latrobe. So she is um, sort of an illuminating example of who a lady manager might have been. Um, her husband, Ferdinand Claiborne Latrobe, um, was the mayor of Baltimore on and off between 1875 uh, through 1895. And before his mayorship, he was the assistant counsel to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company, which is um, one of the sources of Johns Hopkins immense wealth. And so notably, Mrs. Latrobe's name also appears on the Homewood campus that we have at Hopkins today um, in the Latrobe building. Alongside Mrs. Latrobe was Elizabeth Hop or on the lady managers was Elizabeth Hopkins, one of the descendants of the titular man himself, alongside other women whose husbands or fathers may have served on the hospital boards and numerous other women of prominence with names of Baltimore significance, if only they were identifiable by their husbands. The lady managers unique position as financial and social elites, but also as women in the late 19th and early 20th centuries is underscored by the reality that all recommendations the women made for the asylum had to be approved first by the all-male hospital board with whom they only occasionally disagreed. And by the fact that many of these women are only listed in the hospital's official meeting notes, as I've said, by the names of their husbands. Furthermore, in all of the minutes of the hospital board for the Colored Orphans Asylum that I read through spanned um, from about like 1875 to 1912, um, there's only one meeting where the lady managers are present. And that meeting, unlike all others, was held at the homes of one of the lady managers, Mrs. Daniel F. Pope. And coincidentally, at that meeting, the lady managers, so I'm going to scroll in on the board notes from that meeting right here. This is um, thanks to the Chesney Medical Archive. Um, at that meeting where the women of the where the lady managers and the hospital board were present were present, the lady managers asserted to the Hopkins Hospital Board that the girls of the orphanage were not well equipped to serve as domestic servants when their time at the orphanage concluded, which as Madame Kamal said was usually around the age of 18. To remedy what the lady managers felt was a clear issue, that these girls were not prepared for domestic service, um, the lady managers proposed having the girls in their last year at the asylum be worked out as servants in the homes of the lady managers themselves. While perhaps unsurprising, given that the majority of the interactions between white wealthy women like the lady managers and black women in Baltimore at the time was in the context of domestic service, I was still left deeply uncomfortable by the revelation that the lady manager's imagination of the potential for these girls was so narrow. Um, these girls who were in their purported charge, whom they claimed a charitable purpose to protect, could only go so far as to become a servant in a lady manager's home. So Matt and Kamal have mentioned that, yes, the purpose of the asylum was to prepare these girls um, for domestic, for, among other things, domestic service. But I think it's um, particularly jarring to read that these women not only imagined that service going to other people, um, likely among their wealthy friends, but in their own homes, which, again, is jarring as it was the lady manager's job to purportedly protect and provide for these girls. Um, I was first intrigued by the lady managers due to their unique middle woman <laughs> position um, in the government governance and operation of the orphanage, but I've been kept fascinated by the various ways in which they advocated for or diminished the human value of the girls at the asylum. Um, at times, the managers requested from the board more frequent doctor visits for the girls, a new playground, picnics, or even new toys, and other times you can find in the Baltimore Sun, they created awards for the girls to be that were then announced in the Baltimore Sun. Um, they also advocated at times for refurbishments to, this, to the asylum, all of which had to then be approved by the all-male board. But these requests existed simultaneously with the lady managers' elite position in society, which led them to imagine a future for these girls, which could only result in service to white, to white families. I think it's partic particularly interesting to read this history given the disparity between the resources of these women and what they provided for the girls, which is sort of what Matt was talking about. These women, as I found, were incredibly well-connected in Baltimore society. Their 
um, activities frequently graced the pages of the Baltimore Sun Society page. Their husbands had immense wealth, um, if not their fathers, and they still they couldn't extend um, that privilege, even a small more than a small ounce of that privilege to imagining a better future for the girls who were in their care. Um, I think it's also interesting to note, I talked about the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad earlier. That's where um, Mrs. Latrobe's husband originally worked as general counsel. Um, the, it's interesting because a lot of these girls, rather than being true orphans, were in the asylum because their parents had to provide labor and were there um, for various Baltimore um, companies, organizations at the time, and therefore couldn't take care of their children. So the girls were sort of being taken care for by the asylum because their parents were employed elsewhere. And it is all too likely that a lot of um, the parents or family members of these girls were employed in the service of the husband, the father, the brother of any number of these lady managers whose um, familiar relations or just in general friends and the people with whom they interacted on a frequent basis um, made up most of Baltimore's business elite at the time. Um, so again, basically my conclusions were that all of these women stood to benefit from the considerable wealth of their fathers, husbands, or brothers, but this familial wealth also limited their own respective autonomy, demonstrated by the fact that many are listed only in reference to their husband na husband's names. So in their only instance of true autonomy, which might have been somewhat control over these girls for the asylum, um, their imaginations for the futures of these girls was incredibly limited and influenced by their elite position in Baltimore society. And so with that, I would like to invite Dr. Jones back on to lead us in an audience Q&A. Thanks very much, Emma. And I think Matt and Kamal and Emma Catherine will join us also if you all would turn on your cameras. Um, we have just a couple of minutes. So let me pose one question um, and ask each of you just briefly to comment on it. Um, because we had a, a viewer who asked, um, did you find any personal accounts from the quote unquote inmates or the girls? Now, I know the answer is no, but I'd like you each to comment on that experience of looking to capture the lives, the experience and perspective of the girls from materials um, that were not produced by them um, so why don't we go around, um, and maybe I'll start with you, Emma Petit, if, if I could, um, from the perspective of your look at the lady managers, can we see the girls, can we glimpse them, even as we don't hear their words? Yeah, I'll try to take not too much time because I think Kamal and Matt, Matt might be able to answer this a little fuller, but it is it's sort of hard to see their words at times in their interactions I was reading, which is mostly um, the board reports of things that had been requested by the lady managers. I think where I was able to see the girls a little bit more was in um, Baltimore Sun articles that were about the awards that the girls were going to be receiving, or there was also implemented like a fake monetary system of rewards for the girls. And so I think that was sort of a glimpse into their daily life. But it is interesting because um, it's, it was hard to find a lot of information about the lady managers themselves too, because there's uh, they and the girls share that they were not men at this time, and therefore they were never listed by their full names and were sort of only understood in their proximity to men or additionally for the girls in their proximity to white people. And so I just thought that it was, it made it difficult to find them, um, the managers and the girls because of that unique um, societal hierarchy. And I, so I really applaud Kamal and Matt for how they were able to find the girls. Okay, briefly Kamal. As for me, just to also echo what Emma said, it was incredibly difficult. Um, trying to create a narrative out of just expense receipts and financial records isn't the easiest, most easiest thing to do. Well, yes, we can get a glimpse into like what items of clothing they bought, what food they had, how long they boarded in like some post-closure institutions. While we can get glimpses of objectively what their lives were like, 
I don't think unless information presents itself that we will ever truly get a sense of how the girls themselves felt, which is disheartening and saddening, but best we can do is try to share their stories the best way we can, encourage others to maybe explore that. But yes, it's been incredibly difficult, but very exciting journey when trying to uncover little tiny pieces of what we can find. Thank you, Kamal. How about you, Matt? Yeah, Kamal, I really appreciated that section you had on like the difficulty of working with financial materials. You know, for every like one good source you find, you find like 50 receipts about like boiler repairs and like ice boxes. So uh, yeah, it's definitely had its like challenges, but I kind of like that. I think that's really like the mark of like good historical research, right? You have these like very tailored problems that are very hard to overcome, but you do it. I mean, yes, it is true that like looking at receipts, sometimes you'll get like a sentence about like the actual life of the girl, but you don't really get anything from their perspective or um, yeah, nothing from their perspective or sometimes you just get their names. But I think, I mean, you just have to kind of like, as one of my professors say, like ring out the source in a way, right? You can tell if it's a receipt, for instance, like, okay, where is this in Baltimore? Um, what has this organization done in the past? Has the asylum interacted with this in the past? So it, it is unfortunate that we don't have like direct, for example, like diary entries by the girls themselves. But I don't think we should like kind of lose hope because of that, because I think if we're just like rigorous enough, I think we can paint a more robust uh, picture of what life was actually like. And I, I just want to kind of remind everyone that this is like an ongoing process, right? Like we're not the we're not the last ones to be doing this work. I really hope that people really build off on our work in the future and kind of like put us to shame in a way, you know. So yeah, it's had it's definitely hardships, but I think it's doable if we just kind of keep at it. So yeah. Beautifully put, Matt. Um, Emma Catherine, I mean, I think your work with the walking tour was trying to help us you know, walk at least a few blocks in the shoes of the girls. So just say a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, um, well, for one, um, I just, I feel like I'm the wrong person to ask because I just wrote a dissertation chapter, um, you know, of my own work on, on um, indigenous women in 17th century Florida. And so like I had compared to these records, I had nothing. And, and so, you know, this almost felt like a nice break. Um, which sounds kind of terrible, but, you know, but like actually to be able to go and walk these streets and have some of the buildings left to see the Orchard Street Church where we know, we know they went like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and um, just to be able to find some tangible, you know, get some tangible sense of, of like the, their, their, their place or their, their view of the city was um, was amazing, but um, I don't know. Props to you all for for you know bringing out the sources in this way. That is a really valuable skill. Yeah, thank you. Um, folks are asking about um, more uh, opportunities to um, look at your work, to um, uh, probe some of the sources you've been looking at in more. Um, so um, these researchers are all. Um, in the midst of um, completing these projects. These are works in progress. So um, thank you to them for letting us have a preview of what's coming. Um, but these final projects will be published as part of our Substack series um, over the course of the uh, spring and summer of this year. So please follow us over on the Substack um, and um, there you'll have an opportunity to do a deep dive with all of these wonderful researchers. And we can't thank you all um, for your time, for your thoughtfulness, um, and more. You have really raised the bar for our work at Hard Histories and here at Johns Hopkins. And it's been for me a tremendous honor to work with you. And with that, I'm going to very quickly pass it back to Dr. Rosencrantz, who's going to take us out. Thank you, Dr. Rosencrantz. Uh, thank you. I have uh, truly been honored to be a part of this project this semester and the hard work that all of you have done to further illuminate the landscape of Baltimore, both historically and geography, geographically, is incredible. And I look forward to the rest of the research. I want to thank uh, Emma Catherine Bilski, Kamal Carr, Matt Palmer, Emma Petit, and Dr. Martha Jones for this incredibly rich conversation that is, as Matt said, to be continued, right, Matt?
Uh, thank you also to our audience for watching and for sending in your great questions and to the team at F the SNF Agora Institute for their support for this event. You can learn more about hard histories at Hopkins at hardhistory.jhu.edu. Additional information about Hard History's event series, as well as YouTube videos of past events, is posted at snfagora.jhu.edu slash event. Please also subscribe to Hard History's Substack at hardhistoriesjhu.substack.com, where they regularly post updates about what they're up to. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great evening.